people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Boss and Share Shots. We still have high hopes of delivering quality wrestling content, and if not, we'll sprinkle in the yellow shoe guy and the boss bitch, you know, so we still get over. I am your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and I'm glad to be here on this journey, and tonight that journey is Scandals in the Territories. Joining me tonight is the man who comes with his own disclaimer, and that is the opinions of the Yellow Shoe Guy are his and his alone, and not those of the Smack Draw Podcast Network or Botch Pots and Share Shots. Bobby Mack, how are you? I am fantastic. Don't you just love all the haters out there? They hate me to my back, but when they get face-to-face with me, they just absolutely love me on these podcasts. Do you have glad any, they're watching. any new dramas in the TikTok world in Bobby Mack's life? Um, no, it's actually been pretty quiet on the talk. I've been gaining a lot of followers, uh, surprisingly enough, just by showing divas in their bathing suits. Really weird, but I guess guys and girls like that. Also joining us, as always, perched upon her iron throne in the boss bitch corner, is the Hova to my Beyonce, the Bonnie to my Clyde. She is the boss bitch, Miss Allison Siegel. Allison, how are you? I'm good. Good. Well, I also want to thank Mr. Hill Tactics over on Twitter for that dope intro. Guys, I always start every episode the same and isn't going to be the same tonight. What has you guys pissed off for greatness this week in the world of professional wrestling? I don't know if Allison has this on her list, but she probably does. <laughs> this whole uh, this whole rumor that Stone Cold's coming back for another match at WrestleMania and it's going to be against CM Punk. Like, it's got the wrestling world, I think, a buzz. Like, even Jim Cornette talked about or not Jim Cornette. Um, Ric Flair was talking about it on his uh, podcast uh, this past week. And he says that if it does happen, that Stone Cold should just totally destroy CM Punk in 30 seconds and the match be over. Hmm. I don't actually have that. Really? I know. It's a first. You're slipping. I am. I also would not give a shit about a Stone Cold Steve Austin CM Punk match because I know there would be nowhere for that story to go. None. Not that I thought Kevin Owens would, but Kevin Owens and Stone Cold make sense. Give him the rub. Take what he needs to to put KO over, but still let Stone Cold get the win. I don't see there being any way for CM Punk to do that with Stone Cold, and there be there's no point in it. Well, I would say the one point would be Punk coming back to WWE, like that would be huge. Um, but I agree that there's not much like what would really happen in this match. Like I know that they had some kind of like video game like squirmish a couple of years ago at one of the um, launches of one of the WWE 2K games uh, that they kind of went back and forth with each other on. But at the same time. Punk, I think, Punk, unlike KO, would demand a real match with uh, Austin, like not a brawl. And I just don't think that that's really part of Punk's repertoire at this time, that he doesn't want to do the brawls. He wants to actually show off in the ring and have a good match. So, yeah, I agree. The match shouldn't happen. I think Stone Cold made his comeback. That should be the end of it. Um, it was good while it lasted. And uh, let's uh, let's live for the memories. Miss Siegel, what has you pissed off for greatness this evening? I think that them having Chris Jericho and Cesaro and Daniel Bryanson. I can't do it every time I fuck it up. Brian Danielson going after the ROH title is dumb. Like, Brian Danielson held that title when he was green. Like, they should use the ROH as like an NXT Bobby, yeah, I think that I would think that Tony though he he bought that company because he had for some reason thought that company was still had value, um, still had name value. Like really, I think the only thing that values is the library that it houses um, that I think would be better used with WWE in their production. Um, until until you know AEW can actually put on a show that doesn't have production issues, I don't see where that library is going to really benefit them. Um, they don't you know have the guys to make this you know those long story scores so. I think it's I think it's actually a shame for the wrestling business that that WWE wasn't allowed to buy the ROH library. Is it my turn? Yep. Well, what has me pissed <coughs> off for greatness tonight is the fact that Tyrus, formerly known as Brodus Clay, is holding the ten pounds of gold in what ultimately is a political stunt 
attempting to garner unnecessary heat from the IWC. But in reality, what Billy's doing is instead of gaining a bunch of heat the way he thinks he is, every day that Brodus Clay holds that title, he loses ground that he made up on bringing the 10 pounds of gold back to relevancy. So what pisses me off for greatness is that Tyrus now is the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. Hey, Will, um, on the switchboard, line two is uh, Brodus Clay's mama. Uh, you might want to pick that up. <laughs> she is calling in to uh, to give me a new one. I mean, do either of you give a shit about the NWA title enough to be angry about it? Or do you guys understand where I'm coming from? He needs a Nick Aldis right now. He needs, as much as I hate to say it, a Matt Cardona. He needs somebody that has a great name that isn't just carrying weight and heat because he's on Fox News. Aldis I mean, was... Yeah. Go, Bobby. I was going to say, Aldis was the best hope for the NWA to relaunch. Like, you had Aldis there with the original part. You had Cornette there. It had the old NWA feel to it. It was studio wrestling. Um, but, you know, really, since Cornette left, it started to fall down. Then the pandemic, I think, really just kind of killed the NWA again. Uh, Trevor Murdoch, really nice guy. Uh, decent in the ring. Should he have been the flag bearer for a brand? I'm not 100% on that. Uh, but Tyrus most definitely should not be the flag bearer on any brand, um, unless, of course, it is Fox. I mean, NWA is floundering at best at this point. Like, if we liquidate botch spots and chair shots, do you think we'll have a reasonable amount of money like to buy the NWA from Billy Gorgon at that point? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> do you think we can afford those three letters at this point? Because of Tyrus being the world the world champion, as I fumble through those words. I mean, even without him being the champion, like, they're just... Marie says it should only cost $1 because of Tyrus. <laughs> that's what I was implying, is that our podcast that's worth next to nothing would be worth more than the NWA would. Thank you, Marie, yeah, for I picking don't... up on my dry sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. I don't even. I don't even think that the WWE. I, mean, I don't even think the NWA library at this point is worth anything. Like, what really big matches have they put on? What value has the show really put on? Other than you know, an old Southern manager telling a really bad joke that somehow the producer allowed on the taped episode of an of a show. Let me ask you a question, Bobby and Allison. Uh, this right here is something that just came to mind. Now that we've got Hunter driving the you know, driving the Ferrari, so to speak, in Connecticut. What would you think if WWE used those billions of dollars to acquire some of these Ring of Honors, these MLWs, these PWGs, these Limitless Wrestling, some of these bigger to mid-sized, like, independent promotions? And what if Hunter were to implement kind of an NWA-style governing body to build a true minor league style farm system. Um, a friend of the show here in Nashville, I won't name drop him, but he used to be on the radio on a wrestling show, recently made a comment about a mud show because of the level that it was in wrestling. And I was like, what if there was a way to manage all of those levels of wrestling again like the NWA used to do? Do you think Hunter could have the power in Connecticut to do that if WWE wanted to to pull a Black Saturday again and buy a bunch of little independent promotions to turn them into farm systems. I, mean, I they, don't see I don't see the value in it. Like they have the performance center. Um, I do see value more in the territories that are out there right now because you do actually get real time. You know, you real you go into real in front of real fans, and you know, you really have real matches. You know, that are different. Um, I do see that value, but I don't see any or like anybody that owns a promotion going, okay, you know what? As soon as my guy gets really good and gets to the top of the card, yeah, we expect just to lose him to WWE. Like, it would have to be, I think, a really big deal, like, to where maybe they're featured on Peacock, each one of their shows is featured on Peacock as a, you know, addition to it, um, and WWE. But again, WWE, other than being able to steal people from every single territory, you know, that's not a lot to gain, and that's a lot to lose for these small independents. Allison, what are you thinking? I mean, if they did it right, I think it could be cool. Like, 
and to also give money to these smaller promotions to help them up their production value and get more fans into the sport as a whole. I think it could be an FCW, OVW kind of situation where they have farm systems set up in different markets. Not that OVW and FCW overlapped by a whole lot, but technically speaking, they did because Al Snow is still running OVW to this day, and they've got some pretty decent, like, you know, decent champions right now working. Um, There's a lot of guys that were going towards the, the twilight of their career, but there are some young guys getting ready to break through that we'll see in AEW and WWE in the next couple of years. Right, but you hear like from the guys that ran OVW, you know, they would they would get these guys up their card and get good TV ratings. The next thing you know, they go to a WWE show, they come back and like they're they WWE shave their head bald, like and totally change their character on that one show and then send them back. Well, that would be something that Triple H could manage a little bit better in more regional more regional call ups. If you're with one booker right now then you would be like, okay, because WWE already uses rolling 90-day contracts. So they could decide inside of 90 days, we want to call this guy up. His contract here is done on the first, or that means on the second, he's going to be on Raw. You see what I mean? Like they already have contracts in place to where they could use this system to where every 90 days they could call up and, you know, relegate guys around the farm systems based on how they're needed. Right. I do see that. I see the point of it. And again, I'm all for the different styles that could actually go into this. Um, as long as, the, you know, and these are all pretty reputable um, companies uh, that you've mentioned. So I wouldn't have any doubt that the guys would be trained correctly, but you know, when they get to WWE, is it old school WWE of the 80s and 90s where the guy comes in and he uses his reputation and he uses what he knows in the ring? Or is this current WWE where they send them to the performance center and they make them become WWE like before they. Play? I don't know. I think the WWE is like going to the Harvard's of wrestling schools, though. I still think they're the premier wrestling academy when it comes to the schools because guys will spend their whole lives training and then get a shot at the pc you don't unless you're a premier athlete coming out of a division one program in the the next in line program or you're a charlotte flair kind of person very few people start their training at the performance center uh i'd say yes and no like they they are they are getting a lot of collegiate athletes um you know they they do still, you know, farm the model leagues and stuff like that a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I'd say for the most cases, yeah, the people are coming from the indies, um, but they are reprogramming them. It's like, yeah, I'd say it's like almost like when you go in, like, it's the military and they beat you down, uh, tell you whatever you know isn't right, and then they rebuild you back up into their their shape and their form. So I guess the one positive I would say from the Performance Center now is that you do actually have a true main eventer running it unlike before where you had mid-card WCW guys running it. So having Shawn Michaels there, I think, is a huge benefit uh, to the entire program. Agreed. Um, So that gets us there. Uh, Allison, I'm going to send it up to you now. News and rumors. Uh, Let's get rolling with that, huh? (laughs) Uh, The first thing on my list is NXT is introducing a new match type. It's going to be called the Iron Survivor. Have y'all heard anything about this? Yeah, the Iron Survivor Gauntlet Challenge or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, The way I understand it is it's like going to be a 30-minute Iron Man match. There's going to be a 25-minute period where two guys start, then every five minutes the guys come out and they're going to get scores based on pinfalls, but if you're pinned, you have to spend 90 seconds in the penalty box, which prohibits you from being able to score more pinfalls. Um, so it's an interesting concept. There's two of them. Uh, Bobby, I know you're not a fan of that. Two gimmick matches in the same night, but they're going to do one women's match, then they're going to do one men's match. The winner of each match gets a shot at the respective titles. Um, I think it's a cool idea. I think it's uh, moderately innovative. It reminds me of war games without the cage, but also without teams. Um, 
so I, I get the the kind of feel for it. It seems like a Shawn Michaels match because it's an Iron Man match. I feel like that's ultimately like when I think Iron Man matches, I think of Shawn Michaels. I think of Bret Hart. I think of, you know, like those are pretty much the only two guys that come to mind. Um, Tommaso Ciampa had a really great Iron Man match. Bobby, what do you think about it? I saw the headline. I just, I didn't look it up. Um, I figured it was going to be some kind of Iron Man stipulation. Um, I think one, again, it's not just having the same gimmick match on the, on the same card, but it's having a men's version and a female version. Like, I think anybody that, you know, has gone and seen Black Panther lately might agree with this. You don't necessarily need the sexes to be equal. And they don't necessarily need to have the same match on the card because what's going to inevitably happen is the strategy of the match, the story of the match, whoever's going second, it's going to take a real talented second uh, match to overshadow the first match and not be too compared to the first match with the same spots. And we've talked about this before. Kofi and Naomi at the Royal Rumble, neither one of them ever get thrown out until, you know, they do get thrown out. Um, you just don't need that. And and Wakanda forever. Spider-Man Bobby today. Which Spider-Man are you from the Spider-Verse, the multiverse? Uh, I would definitely be um, the amazing Spider-Man, but that's just what my last date said. The amazing Kevin McAllister Spider-Man? <laughs> <laughs> it's the hat! Okay. Let's see. WWE also applied for another trademark, Oba Femi, on November 10th. It looks like it's going to be a new wrestler named potentially one for NXT or the Performance Center. And what's it called? Oba Femi. O B A F E M I. Um. Judging by okay. that name, I would make an ignorant assumption to assume that it would probably be some sort of Samoan or South Pacific character. Um, we could be a little bit more specific. We know that The Rock's daughter, Ava Rain, is super active in an NXT uh, thing right now, so that probably wouldn't be it. But it could be in a number of people that's in the Performance Center or in one of these uh, systems coming up. Uh, there's no way of knowing who it is just based off of that because all we got was Uncle Howdy months ago and then now we just now found out who that character is. You know what I mean? So this might not be a name we'll use for weeks or months before we find out who it is. Maybe it'll be Sammy's uh, bloodline name. That would be awesome for them to completely <laughs> rebrand it and put a whole new yeah, name re on it. Rechristen. Yeah, rechristen him. If it is Samoan, maybe. I think it's definitely going to be a female. Whoever what, it is. Uh, what's about what's the Fatu that's in MLW, Bobby? The uh, the other uh, Uso little brother, the one that hasn't uh, got into Jacob. the J yeah. There you go, Jacob Fatu. He's the one that hasn't broken into WWE yet. Uh, Rikishi has said that he wants to get him over there, and there's been a few other people name dropping him to get him into the WWE system because of how good he is. Uh, do you think another, you know, bringing in somebody like a Jacob Fatu would be a, just another way to strengthen the bloodline story? Or do you think eventually enough's got to enough's got to be enough? Something no, I think good. Um, I don't know if you necessarily have to put with the bloodline. Like, you know, famously in the 90s, you had Yokozuna, you had the head shrinkers, um, you know, you had a bunch of the Samoan uh, dynasty there and they didn't. Oh, there we go. Uh, and they didn't. Marie always knows. Boom. Uh, looking in the chat. Um, but you can always, you, you know, Marie. yeah, they they didn't they didn't always, you know, say that they were all related. So I don't think you necessarily always have to follow the family bloodline until, you know, it makes sense, like a little bit later on. Uh, Jacob Fatu is awesome. Like he really is. Like, he's an amazing athlete. He's probably more savage than what. um uh, what's his name? So uh, Solo is at this like really like he he like to me is more of a badass than what Solo portrays. Um, not that the Solo is not portraying a good character, but uh, Jacob Fatu. I don't know why the WWE has been sour on him for so long, but uh, they really need to 
jump on him uh, while he's uh, still able to be jumped on. Next, we have another opinion of Road Dog that nobody asked for. Um, he's now claiming that Vince McMahon does not watch WWE. Yep. That Vince McMahon didn't watch WWE product, right? Yep, at okay. all. Like, he doesn't watch any of it. He's never watched any of it. We know at one point that he said that he didn't watch anything but WWE programming. So I think at some point he probably got to the point where he wasn't watching stuff that he wasn't there for. You know what I mean? It probably got to the point that if he wasn't there for it live, he wasn't taking the time to watch the film for it anymore. He has enough minions and enough guys in place that he didn't have to watch every house show. You know what I mean? By the late 90s, he had you know, Bruce Prichard, uh, Jim Cornette, uh, Vince Russo. He had guys on guys on guys that would watch all of this for him then, 25 years ago. So you know now in 2022, he had plenty of people to watch stuff for him. If he wasn't there live, he probably didn't watch a, a WWE live event. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, I think one thing with Vince, I don't think people give him enough credit for the wrestling historian that he actually is. Uh, I agree there's, a thousand percent with that. Yeah, like there's there's some video of him um, performing in, uh, I think it was Memphis, actually, um, where he went on there. He was just the WWF commentator at that time, but he went on there and it was like really the first introduction of Mr. McMahon. And he knew he knew of Memphis wrestling. I think he did know the territories, you know, a little better than what people do give him credit for. Or what he um, led on to. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I know, you know, because. You know, back then, Cafe, you're only going to support, you know, your brand. And, you know, New York is the, the only place that you can wrestle. But I know that Vince, from his creative side, from the stuff that he's reached out for, even like when he joined with Cornette to relaunch the NWA um, and put and even with Smoky Mountain as well later on to put those two on the map, ECW partnership, um, bringing in Jerry Lawler. Like he, he knew of these people. And I do think that he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. But you know what? It. His age now, um, you know, he's newly single slash, you know, not legally or whatever, but he's he's enjoying life probably for the first time ever, just being able to sit back and not watch the product. So if he's not watching it now, good for him. Like enjoy retirement and enjoy those paychecks that he keeps getting from every time that they're on Mondays and Fridays. I don't think it was that he doesn't watch it now. It I, The statement was more he's never watched it. Well, I think it's hard not to watch it when you're sitting in Gorilla every Monday, Friday, and every fourth Sunday um, watching what's going on and either shaking hands and hugging people when they come back through the curtain or telling them how terrible they are. Right. I just feel like every week we have a new road dog opinion. Like, it, there's a new one every week. Well, this is also Ooh, coming from the guy... This is also coming from the guy who said he was a better you know, sports entertainer than Bret Hart was because that's what mattered because that's where the money was made, which is a bullshit statement on many levels because although the road dog could out-talk Bret Hart, the epic difference between his in-ring ability versus road dog's in-ring ability is mon like astronomical, bigger than Mount Everest, the Marianas Trench. Like, Bret Hart trumps road dog in every capacity except for speaking on the mic yeah and it's funny because Shawn michaels was asked that same question this week and he answered it you know pretty clearly that he said brett was the better wrestler but hands down Shawn michaels said that he was the better sports entertainer well the the i've said the one thing there was the difference in the mic skills between sean and brett were so much different then that's what allowed him to surpass him best overall was because of that. Because Sh Brett wasn't that much of a better worker than Sean was in ring. Sean was a, one of the best technical entering workers of all time. He could call a match as well as anybody. Or if you wanted to sit there and plan every move and hold, he could do it that way too. That's what made Shawn Michaels so versatile. Yeah, and what's amazing is like for 10 years, he was doing all that supposedly – on somas and alcohol and drugs and he was still putting on better matches than most of the other guys on the card one of my favorite one of my favorite wrestling 
angles of all time is Perk Angle. And that was when he got to TNA and he was doing moonsaults off the 20-foot six-sided cage and stuff. Like, that yeah. Kurt Angle was nuts. Yeah, he really was. He, um, looking back, like, he could probably still be wrestling, though, if it wasn't for that period. Because he, Yeah, as I said, that seven-year period is the reason why Kurt Angle had to retire. Yeah, he, he didn't have any, just like, it's kind of my fear with AEW, nobody's telling these guys no when they should be. Moving right along, um, Jonah has been offered a new WWE contract, and we may see Chelsea Green again. Jonah Hill? <laughs> Jonah, like, uh, no, what's his name? Not Jonah Matt Hill. Card- Matt, Matt Cardona? Card- Cardona? Did you mispronounce Matt Cardona? No. That is way off. Jonah Hill. <laughs> Jonah Hill. He's the, he's the, the, the pudgy kid from uh, Superbad. Right? That is correct, That's sir. That's Jonah you Hill. One- is, he signed with WWE. Yeah, apparently Freddie Prince wasn't enough for them, so they went ahead and signed Jonah Hill. What the fuck Next- is Jonah Hill going to do? Is he gonna, He's going to challenge uh, the fucking Paul kid, right? I can't stand you. The yeah, Paul kid. Totally. Jonah Hill totally. versus Luke Paul. You know, yeah, WrestleMania with 39. Seth Rogen, with Seth Rogen in the corner. With Seth Rogen. They might not be able to pass the... Uh, Suppose the WWE uh, drug uh, awareness plan. No, they don't test for weed anymore. Oh, do they not? No. Thank God they finally got to the 22nd century. So are you getting ready to join? <laughs> for what? Because they don't test for... Never mind. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, that same rumor. Bronson Reed. Yeah, I know. We're just giving... We're just giving crap. Uh... Jonah blocked the podcast months ago because I uh, very romantically said that he couldn't work like a big man should work. And uh, he took his ball and went home in the social media farm and decided to block botch bots and chair shots. I think he still has me blocked as well on my personal page. Uh, but what? Jonah Hill. No, not Jonah Hill. We're talking about Bronson Reed, the, uh, the Australian uh, professional wrestler. Oh, the guy, I have no clue who he is. Yeah, that guy. Block- Not Jonah Hill, the actual wrestler. Uh, what's his okay. name? The Big Dog? Is that what he's going by now? Top Dog? Big Dog? Top. Top Top Dog? I have no idea. The Quick Top, top dog. dog. Yeah, thank you, Marie. Marie, you're the unofficial third, uh, fourth member of this team. I was about to say third member as I'm looking at a screen with three people on it. The unofficial fourth member of Botch Bots and Chair Shots. Oh, there's that doll. <laughs> it's creepy, man. It needs a cameo on the Chucky show. Why? So it could kill Liv Morgan, too? How dare you? Oh, golly. Next. Next is Matt Cardona says he has unfinished business with WWE. Can we just go ahead and bring up is do you have the uh, the rumors list that you brought up the other day uh, with the list of the ladies names on it? Becky was coming back. Chelsea Green was coming back. Uh, who else was in the rumble on that list that you said? Oh, uh... pull up the tweet. Oh, uh, was with Cardona. No, Chelsea is married to Matt Cardona. But there was a list of... A leaked rumble list. Yeah, it was a leaked women's rumble list with Charlotte's return, Becky's return, Chelsea Green was on the list, uh, Sasha and Naomi was on the list, and there were a few other that were cross-promotion names that hadn't been announced or worked with yet. I think a couple Impact ladies. Uh, I'd like to see pulling it up, back. so I'm swimming in place and treading water until she can get the list up. Hopefully, in I, just think, a second. James, I think Mickey James coming back for a second year. I think that'd be pretty cool. I think they're going to kill it though. If you give this this many returns, I don't think that works unless it's legends. Like if you have you know people like that, people really genuinely want those three ladies from the four horsewomen to come back, and they've all been off TV for a long time. That's it's too much. Like where? How do you tell all those stories all at one time? I think this is the perfect jumping off point for it, though. 
a chance for them to bring back a fresh roster and have all these women back and ready all at the same time and then be like, boom, holy shit, it's time to go to work with all these arrivals. Uh, you ready to go, Al? Yeah. So we have, I'm going to list them in order of the way that it says they're coming in. Bailey, Becky Lynch, Mandy Rose, Emma, Shayna Baszler, EO Sky, Shotzi, Carmella, Asuka, Dakota Kai, Zelina, Lacey, Alexa, Dana Brooke, Mia Yim, Rhea Ripley, Sarah Logan, Chelsea Green, Dewdrop, Charlotte Flair, Liv Morgan, Natalia, Candice LeRae, Beth Phoenix, Nikki Cross, Tamina, Sonia, Raquel, Naomi, and Sasha, and then they have Sasha winning. Um, apparently, there's a men's list that leaked. Leaked. Yeah, well, this happens every year. They, well, they that, put out nothing these... is confirmed. It's all speculation anyways. Uh, but I think if they wanted to shoot their shot and have a whole lot of people come back, the Rumble's the perfect opportunity to do that. I don't know. I just, like I said, I just find it difficult to, if you have 10 people come back and on Saturday, by Monday, you have to have a story for five of those people. And by Friday, another story for the other five people that either involve them against each other or them against the ladies that have been running the show for the past couple months while they've all been gone. Well, and I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be right if you just put them in, like if Becky and Charlotte come back, you throw them in a program together, then that overshadows everything that all the other women have been doing. And I'm just saying that as an example. You're missing the point here though. You know, it's the, the halfway point between WrestleMania and, uh, and Royal Rumble. And this is the thing I wrote about it. I said so. I said, ooh, this is the perfect opportunity for it. It's 25 years since the Montreal screw job. It might be 25 years to the day. Today's the 17th, right? Yes. Yep. 25 years to the day of the Montreal screw job, episode 101, Botch Bots and Share Shots. <laughs> but the thing to remember about the that 16th. is uh, Elimination Chamber is being held in February. No, not February. I'm sorry, March, maybe? End of February, beginning of March, before WrestleMania, but between Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. They're hosting an Elimination Chamber in Montreal. So that's the perfect opportunity for a pay-per-view to have five or six women in the main event to show off and showcase a story built around a bunch of people competing for that WrestleMania spot. So I elimination, lim chamber, elimination Chamber being the halfway point is the perfect kickoff spot to have a lot of fresh faces in your story. But again, if you put five <laughs> ladies that are all returning, what what does that say about your roster that's been there for the past six months? And I thought that they eliminated the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. No, it's it's running in Montreal because I, I did a... Uh, one of my little TikTok things I do, what we wrote home about. It's a TikTok series nobody asked for where I give you topical news and rumors inside the world of professional wrestling. Uh, that's the that's a cheap plug. It was a shameless plug, but it's my fucking show. Half of it's Allison's. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby, you get half of my half. How many followers are you guys up to? Uh, I'm almost to 600 on TikTok. Nice. We're not going to talk about my TikTok numbers. Allison doesn't play with the algorithm. She releases one video every five days, and then she's like, why doesn't anybody follow me? I ain't got time for that. That's because you're, 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 like, you're the only one of the three of us with a real job. Somebody has to work. <laughs> we should just get a big house, and all of us just move into it like content creators. <laughs> and Allison's the only one that works, and the rest of the time she's just babysitting me and Bobby while we run around in our baseball t-shirts playing video games. Yeah, I was going to comment on that. Um, that's gimmick infringement. That's two weeks in a row. Well, look, dude, fucking Miz came all over my gimmick. That sounded weird. <laughs> uh, he came on... Hold the fuck. <laughs> the Miz wore a cardigan on Monday night and then put a pair of glasses on. And I was all about the cardigan until he put the glasses on. And then I was like, that's downright gimmick infringement. But in my defense, I haven't really been wearing much cardigans this winter. I was a hoodie guy. Once I got through, uh, you know, the C word and I wasn't having to worry about having like, you know, access to a port, I liked having hoodies on again. So that's what I've been rocking. I've been rocking hoodies. So in the I, winter, 
Your biggest winter coat is a hoodie because you live in fucking Texas, Bobby. Yeehaw. <laughs> Lord. Um, XWWE ref names Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho as the worst guys to work with. Do what? Say that again? An ex ref says that Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho are the worst guys to work with. <clears throat> Probably because they take it so serious. Um, I don't know. Off topic just a little bit Jericho on The Masked Singer. I've seen this on TikTok. I don't actually watch that show. Yes, you yes. could have heard you could have heard a pin drop when they revealed it was Chris Jericho. Like nobody knew who he was. The judges like so overreacted, so like pretended like they knew who he was. Like it was sad. It was really sad for him. But uh and I'm sure his ego I'm sure his ego got really hurt by it. But here's the thing, not everyone's gonna look up. Chris Jericho to see who the fuck he is. He thinks he's a star. That's the problem. Is he thinks he's a mainstream star because he's on those, what was those old VH1 shows where he would talk about it, like give his opinion on something? Behind the music. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking of old VH1 shows, man. Honestly, I'm just yeah. flying by my pants. You know, I think actually that was it. I think it was behind the music or like something like that or like one of those like retro 80, like watching old 80s clips or 90s clips and just giving your worthless opinion on it. Like, you know, when you're on a show and the other guy is Gary Coleman, then you should recognize, hey, you know what? I might not be, you know, a superstar. Mm. No offense to Gary Coleman. But I think Chris Jericho is one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time. I'll say that out loud. But I don't think Chris Jericho needs to be anywhere near a title picture right now in his career. He needs to be doing nothing but elevating young talent below him. He doesn't need to be the Ring of Honor title. Yeah, the only the only belt that he needs is the one to hold up his pants. That doesn't work all the time. He wears tights. He ain't got to worry about no belt. He should because his tights don't fit. Dude, Chris Jericho's fucking stacked in 2022. No, he This is. is not the same Chris Jericho from 2019. I know, but his pants are like so about to fall down. But I think they're thinking that like him being on the Mass Singer will do for AW what the Miz being on Dancing with the Stars did. But I don't think it's going to get over as well. I think when I think the Miz, I think of the real world, not Dancing with the Stars. Right, but during his injury break with his knee or whatever, he was on Dancing with the Stars. Because everybody knows the best way to rehab from injury is to go out and ballroom dance for six weeks. It actually yeah. is. Like. Who else was on there? The Bellas? Mm, only. I can't tell the difference. One's got boobs and the okay, other one which doesn't. Which one was with John Cena? The one with boobs. Southpaw Regional Wrestling. Nikki. Thank you, Murray. Yeah, Southpaw Nikki, Regional Nikki Wrestling. Nikki was on <laughs> Dancing with the Stars, and that's how she met her now husband. Oh, I thought about it. Bobby, in that, sk in that thing we watched last night, Southpaw Regional Wrestling, it was Rusev. Rusev plays this ridiculous country <laughs> bumpkin southern wrestler, but we it was the way he was talking. He sounded like an Eastern European trying to pretend like he was a redneck. And it was the way he was talking that was ridiculous. He was like, Yeah, thank you, America. Like it was the most like ridiculous, like tried to be southern draw you've ever heard in your life. It was perfect. I'll have to try to. I'll have to try to check it out. Last, I it's tried to watch that show when it came out, and I just I wasn't into it. So maybe, maybe I've relaxed more. I don't like it better. It's like if they recorded when it started. It looked like it was going to be like a 1992 documentary about a small regional promotion, and then when I saw it and realized the whole thing was a rib, I was like, hell yes. Uh, Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson have an on-screen rivalry where they're cutting promos against each other. Like they're these deep South, like heel and babyface wrestlers. At one point, Doc Gallows has two eye patches on and he's got a crutch. <laughs> so it's like ridiculous. He talks about Greg Valentine putting him in an arm bar for five hours till his elbow snaps. Like all the most ridiculous stuff. 
Yeah. Like, like I said, the premise, the premise seemed fun. I just, when I tried to watch it the first time, I guess I just wasn't into it. So I will try to do some homework as I've been assigned and uh, watch it. So maybe one week we can just have a episode about that. Bobby, just get high and watch it. That's what I do. There's no mountains around here. Oh, that's right. Because you're in Tejas. Everything's bigger in Texas, including their jail sentences. Uh, next topic, please, Allison. <laughs> Um, we touched on this a little bit. Uh, Tyrus is the NWA champ. Fires back is the haters. Um, and Billy Corrigan says NWA will be the toughest, hardest hitting wrestling promotion in the world. Allison, what did Billy Corrigan say when we saw them at the the thing before the NWA taping? Oh, good. Will's here. We can start now. Why did they say that? Because your ass was late. <laughs> And Billy Corgan waited to start the event for me. <laughs> really? For what? For a, a Q&A thing with him and Steamboat. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was hilarious because when I walked in the room, I didn't expect Billy Corgan to be standing at the front of the room and me walk in and him call me out for being late by name. But it was awesome. Yeah, he made a Steamboat and Billy Corgan and a whole room full of people wait on him. And they delayed an a NWA taping to wait for him. Because I got high and went the wrong way on the interstate for 20 miles. <laughs> <laughs> Into my hometown. I was driving to this city I was born and raised in. And I drove 20 miles in the wrong direction. I don't know how I do these things, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not making these stories up. Just in case you ever need to know, always tell Will that he needs to be somewhere 30 minutes before you actually need him there. Also true. Yeah, I, I remember those days. I remember those days. Will Gray time. Will Gray time. That's, a, that's WGT, Will Gray time. Mm -hmm. That's a real life thing. What's next on your list? We're not going to talk about what Billy Corgan said. Oh, I mean, Billy Corgan is getting a lot of fake heat right now. He thinks he can get this, like, power heat by being hyper-political, and he's trying to do... Well, he's got all the CYN guys in there anyways. He already brought in all the, the hyper-conservative, like, control-your-narrative people. Uh, EC3 is a bona fide star in NWA right now. Wouldn't surprise me if we don't see him get start getting pushed into the world title picture soon. Uh, but they've got, I mean, he's not wrong in a sense. They have an amazingly talented roster. They've got a lot of really great workers. Uh, they got that one magician dude. <laughs> you know what I'm talking yeah, I about? Think, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be really tough for the NWA to come back to anything that, again, pre-pandemic, like they were on a little bit of a roll. When they lost Cornette, they, they lost that role. Um, they started getting it back just a little bit with um, Wade Barrett being the announcer. But now I, I think they're just falling apart. Like, I don't know if, if I think back, like, you know, Corgan, uh, I think in what was it 95 when he like said, um, I knew my loss before I even learned to speak. And all along, I knew it was wrong. I think if he really looks back to that in the Smashing Pumpkins song of to forgive, he needs to actually forgive himself for what he's done and just restart over. Holy shit, Bobby Mack. Did you just quote the Smashing Pumpkins on Botch Bots and Share Shots? Yeah, why was there a trade? Do you know issue? how fucking expensive that is, Allison? We're gonna have to cut that out. Bobby just cost us like twenty thousand dollars. I mean, he didn't sing it. Okay, it's still fucking close enough because if you have Billy Corgan on your show and you mention the Smashing Pumpkins, the cost of his presence like quadruples. Which a guy brought up the pumpkins at that question, that Q and A, and he was literally like, "Yeah, we're not talking about that right now." Yeah, like, just so you know, you talk, you talk more about those um, jack-o'-lanterns than I did. All I did was and say their names. I'm not saying... Those smashing jack-o'-lanterns. Those smashing jack-o'-lanterns. Um, Sue crush. me on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Lord. So, after AW... Dynamite went off the air last night. MJS addressed punk backstage issues and Tony Khan. Mr. Gray, 
you spoke about this at length earlier. Um, my big takeaway was that my big takeaway was that MJF pretty much said fuck around and find out. He stood up for TK. He stood up for AEW. He said that if it wasn't for TK right now, uh, there wouldn't be pro wrestling left because it would only be WWE. And he even said the words, I like WWE. I love WWE. But right now, the way it is, is that AEW allows for there to be a hotspot for professional wrestlers to have their creative freedoms to do the things they want to do and have a chance to thrive. And without Tony fucking Khan, there wouldn't be another place for the guys to do it. Uh, so I agree with it, but I'm also an MJF guy right now. I feel like they need to put the weight of the company on that man's back, slap him on the ass, and send him on his way and just let him carry the company for the next two or three years. Maxwell Jacob Freeman, he's better than you, and we fucking know it. You know what I mean? He's the man. Give him his roses. I think MJF is really towing a fine line right now. That That speech was definitely an, you know quote-unquote shoot and the fact that it was a it was a face that was not a heel speaking that was a face well he's gonna and, be a face on saturday a hundred percent we know that's gonna be the case he'll yeah, be the good I, guy in the match i think the reason why he said i like wwe because he turned around and looked at tony when he said it was he's got to keep selling this you know the whatever it is in 2024 um the bidding war of 2020. Yeah, the yeah. bidding war, war. So he he almost lost that sell. Like, he almost lost that controversy that he could be going WWE. Um, and he had to – good on him because he regrouped really fast and realized what he said and changed it up. But, um, I, you know, the guy's a talker. He's one of the best talkers in the business, maybe in the you know history of the business. And he did put a very passionate promo – he was able to, you know, put down Punk, and he was able to celebrate the promotion. Um, you know, how much of that does he really believe? I think he believes it a lot, and I would be, I would honestly be surprised if he does jump to WWE because I think he'd be worried about what he could do with his character. And you know, I could think a lot of these guys in AEW are looking at Cody and looking at what Cody's run is going to be because the initial run was strong. But that was under Vince. So now you've got Triple H with Cody. Um, so is his next run going to be strong? And that's going to tell a lot of the AEW guys, is Triple H just going to bury them like he did with all the WCW guys? Or does he have no ill will towards these guys and he's going to celebrate them on their, on their coming over to his company? Yeah. I worry about MJF going to um, WWE and getting lost in the mid-card scene. Because, I mean, he's got Seth Rollins to compete with. He's got Roman to compete with. Drew, like, he's got all these bigger guys. Drew, Karrion Cross, you know what I mean? Like, a Matt Cardona. If Cardona comes back, just to, to tie some stuff in from earlier in the episode. They've got lots of good heavyweight guys right now that could be in a title scene if they had more than one world title. Yeah, and they're going to have to do what they do with, like, Roman and what they were doing with Cody respectfully keep like they can be on tv they can talk but they don't have to be on tv every week they definitely don't need to wrestle every week and they need to like mjf would need to come out present himself you know as just an interview and i could see mjf if they really wanted to go full on i could see them doing a roddy piper piper's pit segment with mjf being that heel that antagonizes all these other guys not necessarily guys that he's in stories with but he can make stories go further. Um, you know, that's what, you know, Piper did with Andre and Hogan specifically, you know, those those four episodes. Um, you know, he did it with Andre earlier on. He did it with Stud. He did it with uh, Davy Boy, or not Davy Boy, with Dynamite Kid. So I think that MJF is a, a rare character that they really need to, if WWE gets a hold of him, they can make him special. And I think he could be another Piper if they make him special. And it's not... A segment in the ring it's give him a set make it separate from what's going on all eyes have to avert from the ring off to another part of the arena to pay attention to what this guy's talking about yeah he said recently in an interview that 
he does not wrestle unless it's, you know, a big deal. Like, he's already stopped wrestling on free TV. He did that a while ago. Like, he will only wrestle at pay-per-views. The problem, though, that I'll, that I see with him is that he's made it very clear that it is 100% about the money and he's going to go to whomever is going to pay him the most. Yeah, and I'm not sure if that's, if that's, I think that's more the character. I don't think that's the true person because this is a kid that really did grow up loving pro wrestling and sure. wanted to be a wrestler, be a sports entertainer. And that's what he's, that's what he's accomplished. So I think that's, I think that's part of his, you know, just his character, like saying that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you look back again, you got Hogan's, you got um, Flair's. They didn't wrestle on TV very often at the height of their career. Um so I think that's made him special with Piper. Piper didn't fa- like famously Piper didn't lose a match. Like he would not get pinned even in the height of Hulkamania in 84 uh, and five. He refused to get pinned by Hogan. You know, when he lost to Mr. T at WrestleMania two, it was disqualification. So I think MJF, he, if he follows that kind of career path, you know, hell what Piper Piper, what wrestled 30 years off and on. And uh, people still talk about him today. So I think MJ, I think MJF could be bigger than what John Cena and Roman Reigns are to these generations. Piper's like Macho Man, where he's always that sixth man of the year award, where he's always right outside the GOAT conversation. But he's he should be. He's everybody's like just off everybody's route Mount Rushmore's. He's just off of everybody's greatest of all time list, but he's always on everybody's list. You know yep. what I mean? He's always one of those solid top five, six, seven, ten people all time. You got anything else for us on News and Rumors? That is it. That is it? All right. This is my favorite part of the conversation. It's the meat and potatoes. <laughs> Tonight we're talking about scandals in the territories. We're going to channel our inner Shonda Rhimes and have a little, you know, Tea and scandal talk here, ladies and gents. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck was going on. I was trying to be my bo- my best like news guy. Uh, I'm just gonna throw it out there. Like, what are some of the things that you think of when y'all think of scandals in wrestling? Allison, you as a new fan of wrestling, recently starting in the last two or three years. Bobby, you as somebody who grew up watching territory wrestling and beyond. What are some of the first things y'all think of when y'all think of scandals inside of the world of professional wrestling? Um, I remember the first big scandal that I, I remember like being a kid and seeing it in the newspaper and newspapers are things that used to come to your house every day. Uh, they're black and white and red in the middle. Um, the, in 1987, it was, a uh, hacksaw Jim Duggan and the iron Sheik got pulled over, um, somewhere and there was, uh, marijuana in the car. So they both got arrested. Now what's crazy about this K Fabe is totally alive. And Hacksaw and Iron Sheik are bitter enemies. Hacksaw raising the American flag, Sheik with the Iranian flag. Um, but yeah, I didn't think it was in New Jersey, actually. Um, so yeah, so that to me, I was like, well, why are they riding together? Because again, kayfabe is 100% real. There's no internet. There's, you know, none of this, like, you know, the dirt sheets were around, but and I didn't, I didn't know what the dirt sheets were. So yeah, like that one, like really like shocked me uh, when I first saw it in the paper. Miss Siegel, do you have any opinions on scandals or hot topics in wrestling in your short tenure as a wrestling fan? Yeah. Um, let's see. I made a list. Um, the steroid situation. Yeah, the steroid trials in the early 90s. That was a big one. There were steroids in wrestling? <laughs> Did you not know that? No. Oh. I thought Super Billy Graham was built that way. He's just built different. Ugh. Yeah. Lord. Um, let's see. The biggest scandal of all. We already talked about it once, but the Montreal Screwjob. No, that's a good one. Yeah. I know things. Not, I'm I wouldn't classify as the biggest scandal of all. Do I think you... it was one of the big ones. I wouldn't say the biggest. One of the biggest, but not the biggest. 
I think there was a lot of pivotal things that happened after Montreal. Had it not happened, wrestling wouldn't have been the same because of the screw job. I think is the point of what she's saying. Because right, it but, was scandalous in a sense that it was scandalous in front of the camera, in the big picture, and it was also scandalous because there were a lot of guys who didn't know if they could trust Vince now because they just watched what they did to the world champion and Brett in his hometown of Montreal. Right, but it also happened, uh, he's actually from Calgary, right? He is, you're right, I'm sorry, but still the thing, the whole like, it's, he's from, it's, it's, it's kind of- it's the, okay, so whatever you so get what I'm saying, smartass. So Wendy <laughs> Wendy Richter got screwed in her country by Fabulous Moolah, the Spider Lady, in Madison Square Garden, say by the same promoter, Vince McMahon. Yeah, 1985, and, 1997. They were 12 years apart. It was the original screw job. That's why when Vince is like, "Oh, I don't know where that idea came from," I've you know, like he denies it when you when nobody seems to, he's got that fucking WWE, you know. Uh, that the what's it called the men in black little flashy thing where they make you forget stuff like he thinks wwe fans all have like short-term memory loss because he did the exact same thing to wendy richter 12 years before but pretended like he had never seen it be done before right and and you know truth be told richter at that time was almost as popular as hulk hogan so, she was super she, over. She played such a huge role in the rock and wrestling connection with the Cindy Lauper stuff. And yeah, one hundred percent. So you know that that was huge. And you know, I've I've heard Cornette and I've also heard Russo both claim that they're the ones that gave Vince the idea. Um, but like you said, Vince Vince had the idea. So you know, it's it's just crazy that you know he. I know he has said on interviews that he forgets things that hurt him. Or pains him, and I I wonder if really the spider the spider lady and uh and Wendy Richter was really something that pained him that much that he would forget. Yes, but when I, I see your concentrate on something else. No, I was um, reading something in the chat. Ritter <laughs> popped in and said something to me, and uh, I was really confused about what. I, never mind, I lost my train of thought about what Ritter was saying to me in the chat versus what you were saying in my headphones about Wendy Richter. So I apologize. Yeah, so I think other, like, I think also like famously you could look at some of the things that like, inv- like involved like the entertainment business. Um, two things that pop in my mind is one Hulk Hogan knocking out Richard Belzer on TV as he's promoting WrestleMania. And also the one where um, Dr. David Schultz ended up punching or at least slapping uh, John Stossel from ABC television. Uh, again, promoting the early WWE or WWF. Um, uh, that was the the smack heard around the world, right? Because he said wrestling was fake, and then Hogan laid the guy out. Uh, no, David. No, David Schultz and John Stossel. Stossel said, "I think wrestling's fake." So David Schultz slapped him first with either a right or a left, and said, "Does that feel fake?" And then as he like started to get up, slapped him again. Um, so yeah, so Stossel, uh, Stossel learned his lesson that day, but David Schultz, um, unfortunately paid the price because here he was coming from regional territories, you know, the AWA and the, um, the, you know, smaller areas to the big WWE during the boom. And he was supposed to be a guy that was going to be in line to fight Hogan. Like he was supposed to be one of Hogan's biggest challengers and Vince, because of all the press ended up just sending him home and firing him. Uh, one of my favorite scandals is something I'm working on right now, it, fresh off of the Tales from the Territories and stuff, but it's right here in my backyard in Memphis, uh, was the Jerry Lawler and Andy Kaufman thing. One of the first work shoots in wrestling is where, as well, uh, because the Kaufman stuff, he worked that so well and took Jerry Lawler, keeping in mind a lot of time in Memphis, uh, in the Mid-South Coliseum, Jerry Lawler was a huge baby face. Like, the people loved him. You know what I mean? And he would bring in these big hill giants. And I've said this story about how the, you know, Texas Red would come in and dethrone him. And then it would be the battle back up against where Lawler could retake the title from him. And uh, we all, we've, we've heard about this. And we've talked about this. And uh, when 
him and Kaufman did that thing. Kaufman was wrestling against women and pulling guys in from out of the crowd and shoot fighting them and wrestling them. Um, a la Reggie Parks and the carnivals in, you know, Canada in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, but when he came in and did it, he convinced everybody that Jerry Lawler was a, like a madman. You know, so Lawler was getting death threats and stuff from this Kaufman angle in real life. Um, all because people thought that he was actually trying to kill Andy Kaufman and he was such a bad guy. And then you got wrestling being pushed into the mainstream on the, the you know, Tonight Show or the Late Show with David Letterman and all of that. Like, Right. And, you know, that was one of the things is, from what I understand, Kaufman wanted to do this in New York. He wanted to do this with the WWF or WWWF, I think, at that time. Um, and Vince Sr., was adamant against it. Like at that point in time, again, kayfabe is like really strong and Vince senior didn't see any money in it. Uh, much like later on when he did terminate Hogan because Hogan wanted to be in the Rocky three movie. So it was really, it could have been even bigger with WWF behind it, but Kaufman, good for him. Like he knew the other hot territory, the other hot place in the area was Tennessee and Tennessee wrestling and him and Lawler, you know, for Jerry Lawler to be on national TV on the David Letterman show, that says a lot for this angle and says a lot for what Kaufman put behind it and for what uh, Lawler did for it. Me and Allison are going back and forth in the uh, the chat. I said she doesn't know anything about wrestling prior to 2019. Um, but yeah, I think that was one of the a good example of a, a scandal in the territories it would have been the, the Kaufman and Lawler stuff because of the way that was handled. Um, Allison, what's another one on your list? Um, prior to nine, or 2019, butthole. <laughs> uh, um, Miss Elizabeth overdosing from drugs that Lex Luger gave her. That's a whole ass scandal. That's a, the whole relationship between her and Macho Man was super weird, yeah? Yeah. I mean, the well, fact that, like, Luger only spent, like, a brief time in jail for this, uh, yeah. So it's not like he fed her the drugs. Like, it wasn't like a, a situation with, um, like, Sid Vicious, not the wrestler, but the um, musical act. Like Sid and person- Nancy? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. fed him the drugs. Like, they were both doing drugs. They were both in their 40s. They are both, you know, human beings that were on a bad path and feel bad for Elizabeth dying. I don't know how much Luger really should have been jailed for or put away for. Uh, you know, he, if you hear the 911 call, obviously he's aware enough that something bad is happening and he wants to save her. So I don't know if he needed to necessarily be punished for it. Uh, I'm glad that he's turned into the person that he is now, uh, other than the physical ailments that he suffers, but you know, it was, unfortunately, it was Luger's wake-up call. Um, so it's sad that a real true legend uh, that we all, like, you know, looked up to growing up and, you know, really, you know, enjoyed watching perform uh, had to end, like, that way. But, again, I don't know if Luger should have been punished for it. It was two druggies that one of them did too much. I mean, but if you look back at, like, documentaries and stuff and things that he said – she started doing the drugs because of him. Like, he got her into it. So, how weak is she that she... True. I want to hang out with the popular guys, so I'm going to do drugs. Like, listen, I I got offered to sleep with a girl in college if I I took a puff off a cigarette, and I didn't take the puff (laughs) off a cigarette with a roommate instead. Wow, Bobby, that's inappropriate. Sorry, one had hour relation. and four minutes. Had relationship. You had with relationships with somebody in college. How could you do that, Bobby? That's sinful. Uh, if, off air, I'll tell you everything that happened. In detail, sir. Chapter book yeah. style. Panama, Panama City. Uh, Bobby, you got a scandal for me? Uh, how about um, when wrestlers go to jail? Like uh, Ken Batera and uh, Masa Saito. Uh, back in 84, it was, yeah. So this was a WWF-kept scandal. Uh, 
the guys were driving around Saido and Ken Batera and McDonald's wouldn't serve them at, I, they had apparently closed and uh, Ken Batera with a clear head, uh, Olympic uh, medalist uh, grabbed a rock and threw it through the window. And when the cops came to their hotel, Later on that night, him and Saito decided to beat up the cops. Uh, famously, though, this is, again, during the peak of the WWF boom. And Vince McMahon thought so so much of Patera that he kept his spot. And when Patera got out of jail in 87, he welcomed him back. And Patera really did fall flat uh, when he came back. Like So Vince pushed him to the moon, thinking that this arrest wasn't going to do anything. But... uh. Nelson doesn't know wrestling before 19, and Bobby doesn't know wrestling after 84. All right, smartass. I'll throw you some. Throw you some. <laughs> That's why so. they have me, Ritter, so I can fill in from 1984 to 2019. <laughs> I've got to fill in the gap between the two of them. Uh, Patera was on the uh, the SummerSlam card in 87, um, mm-hmm. which was the uh, the final farewell for Jim Crockett Promotions before they closed their doors. That was kind of the nail in the coffin. I've said that a lot. Um, yeah, he. I do he feel was a part good the, gap ritter. You're right yeah. about that. <laughs> um, he, he was part of the main event survivor series. That's what I mean. Like he was part of multiple teams. He was a uh, not a sole survivor, but he was he was up there. He had great pushes. Um, he never held the WWE title though, right? No, no, he never held any title in the WWF. Uh, uh, was he an IC champ? I don't think he was, but uh, he was so. usually fighting. Yeah, he was usually an IC IC level person. Uh, so for me, I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna bring it up, and we can just kind of blanket talk about it for a while. And I'm just gonna say the last name of the family. They're from Texas. Uh, their wrestling promotion had four letters, and they're the Von Erics. I've recently visited all their graves, um, other than Kevin, who thankfully does not have a grave yet. Um, you know, it's the family's, it's a tragic, tragic story, their family. You know, Fritz, Von Erich, the father, um, you know, really did push his boys. Um, and that's one of the things that a lot of people do blame him for is that they pushed like he just kept pushing and pushing and it's evident that he didn't want to let go of kayfabe because when you go to their graves it doesn't have their it does have their last name addison on it but then it has all their working names in quotations underneath each one of their names um so you know how much pressure did he put on the you know these guys like when when david passed away in Japan uh, from choking apparently on steak is what they said. And yes, Ritter, that's a 1984 one, February 84. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's controversial. Like, you know, guys were out there drinking with him and had no, like nobody thought anything bad was going to happen, but apparently he must've drank too much or whatever happened, something with his stomach. And he ended up like choking on his own vomit. Um, Mike Von Eric really skinny um had something i can't remember the medical issue that he had but you know mike was pushed to come back like his dad in his hospital room toxic shock syndrome that's what it was um his dad in his hospital room on tv is doing a press conference saying mike's gonna come back bigger and stronger than ever and gonna be the world champ like this kid is sick almost died from an infection and his dad is on national tv on news saying, yeah, he's going to be back and he's going to be the world champ. Like how much pressure is that? So Mike, unfortunately took his own life. Um, Chris Von Eric, the youngest of the brothers, um, very fragile bones, um, asthma just shouldn't be in the wrestling ring. But again, his dad pushed him. He was like five foot, nothing. The smallest of all the kids, the youngest ended up taking his life. Uh, Kerry Von Eric former NWA world champion got in a tragic car accident or motorcycle accident, lost part of his leg and hit it from even the boys, like even his friends when he was in a locker room, he wouldn't let anybody see that he was missing part of his leg and his foot. And again, took his own life. So Kevin is like the only success story. So out of that family, but yeah, it's tragic. What happened to the Von Erics? And really not only did it kill the, 
which is second thought of all this, but that family just, you know, unfortunately it was just, it was too much to overcome, I think for any of those brothers. And, you know, Kevin, Kevin was sad. I remember during the, um, the induction of the hall of fame when he said, you know, I'm not even sure if I'm a brother anymore because they're all gone. There's a quote that I saw like a bit ago. It said it was the Von Erich family is the WWE equivalent of the Kennedys, except with more substance abuse. That's 100% factual. I was going to ask you, Allison, if you knew much about the Von Erichs. And the second thing is asking both of you about the new movie coming out, Iron Claw, with Zac Efron and the dude from The Bear. Uh, all of them playing. MJF is going to be playing one of the cousins in it. Like they've got no, a he... stellar, <laughs> stellar cast. Uh, yeah. Do you think that this is going to be one of those situations where they can put such a they can put a good spin on such a story with such a sad uh, ending? If that makes any I sense hope... to what I was trying to say. Yeah, I hope so. Like when I first heard MJF was cast, I so thought he was going to be Gino Hernandez. Because if you know anything about Gino Hernandez, another guy that probably belongs on this list, um, Gino is one of those guys that he passed away really early as well in WCCW. And I'm not going to tell you what year, Ritter. Um, but he passed away really early as well. And he fits MJF's character. Like, this was a guy that was very pompous. He was a very Ric Flair-style character on TV. And if he would have lived, I would say that Gino Hernandez would have been one of those Ric Flair type of guys. Like, he would be that big name that we're still talking about. Um, but MJF is playing Lance uh, Von Erich, who is the quote unquote cousin of the Von Erichs. And people knew him because he was a local guy in Dallas. And for the first time ever, the people were like looking through Fritz going, wait a second, you're lying to us. Like this guy's not a true family member. Like, and it, it almost exposed WCCW for, breaking kayfabe because they were trying to kayfabe this guy and it just wasn't true but yeah i think with zach efron leading it as kevin von air i think the movie has potential to be good and i hope they can able to spin it to make all the von eric's look good like i'm hoping we don't leave the movie theater thinking that kevin's a victim of his dad i don't i'm hoping that fritz isn't like portrayed as the villain i'm excited Although, to see how they do Carrie winning the title because in wrestling lore you hear about the pop inside of the the stadium that day when Avon Eric finally got the ten pounds of gold like that's one of those historic moments it was an outdoor stadium like it was huge um, so I'm curious to see how they portray that in the in the movie that's one of those moments that that's a real life you know people were there people remember what it was like moment still to this day. So if they don't do it right, it could make or break the whole movie. Right. But I'm hoping, too, that they don't show because Kerry dropped the belt 13 days later. Yeah, he immediately Flair. gave it right back to Flair. But this was more of a, a proud piece. They were giving Fritz what he wanted because WCCW hadn't had a world champion in a while. Uh, where the Funks weren't with WCCW, were they? They went through uh, no. Florida, right? <laughs> No, this was this whole thing for Carrie to get it was because of David dying, um, and yeah, well, it was, it was a the, the thing for the, the the family or whatever. It was a way for them to to give the Von Erich family the roses. Yeah, it was the David Von Erich memorial show. Um, you know, immediately after. But the thing that I hope the movie doesn't show is why Carrie had to give the belt back so quickly was the fact that he was so messed up on drugs at that point in time, allegedly. For our, for our lawyer staff. Um, but that's why he had to give the belt up because he couldn't remember anything. He couldn't, he, he was very unreliable um, from what I understand. And that's, he could have had a good run as the NWA champion. Like Crockett and uh, NWA was willing to, you know, put the rocket ship on him, but he just was not ready. When you think of wrestling families, do you think the Poffos and the Von Erics are equals, or do you put the Von Erics above the Poffos? I wouldn't put either one of them. I, I think if I compared those two families, the Poffos are way above the Von Erics. Um, even if Lanny, Lanny's a jobber, um, Randy's obviously a that fifth guy off the bench. Um, 
But yeah, I think I think Savage's career alone overshadows every one of the Von Erics, including Fritz and his father. Do you think uh, what was what what was his name? Antonio Poffo? Yeah. Antonio Poffo, do you think he did more for wrestling than uh, Fritz von Erich did, even with Fritz booking out of the, the Dallas Sportatorium and all the things historically that Fritz, you know, the stories that he has, uh, the whole he only booked The Undertaker because he looked like David kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Like, do you think that uh, Poffo did more for wrestling than Fritz von, Ver- Fritz von Erich did? No, if you compare the two fathers, Fritz obviously was a promoter for a larger area, um, an area that actually went national, where if you look at uh, Antonio Poffo, um, he booked, he was he was a renegade booker. Like, he was not, like, he invaded somebody else's territory in Tennessee. He was the like, quintessential definition of why they came up with the term outlaw. Yeah, like, like he, he was, was an, an outlaw. outlaw wrestling promotion. Yeah, yep, he was an outlaw promoter. Um, he had a chance that he could have gotten big if Randy wouldn't have left for WWF in 1984. Um, but that's that's where that's where Antonio, I think, really kind of falls off on all this is that fact that he could have been big, but he wasn't. I'm reading what Marie says in the thing. Then again, when we it all comes to the Poffos, I know more about the Von Erics than all the Poffos. I only know Macho Man well. I know of Lanny, but the Von Erics I know more about. And I don't know if that's a regional thing or not, is because I grew up in the American South, so I knew the Poffos and the Von Erics both because of where I was raised, you know. Um, I'm looking up a couple things. Angelo Poffo, not Antonio, Bobby. I was wrong, too. For some reason, I knew it was something. I looked it up because I was like, Antonio doesn't sound right. It's Angelo. Yeah, I didn't think I sent it right either, but I, I, I went with you. I, I followed the host like a good boy. <laughs> Oh, there's something inappropriate I could say, but I won't. Um, another one coming off my list. Uh, the if We're comparing families, the Von Erichs and the Simones. Marie, you missed an episode. One of the first episodes we did with Smack Draw after we switched uh, networks was the first family of wrestling. We did a whole episode that we compared the Hart family and the Anna Y family for the bloodline. And uh, we actually all, I think we all agreed on that episode that the Anna Y and the Samoans have taken on the role as the first family of wrestling, just the longevity and the amount of people and everything that have gone into it. We think the Samoans are number one now over the Von Erics, over the Hearts, over the Funks, you know, over the Ortons. No, the number one family in wrestling is the McMahon family. Oh, well, huh? uh, she know what we mean by that. Um, another one is a complicated relationship in wrestling that had some scandals was Jesse the Body Ventura and uh, the uh, Jesse the Body Ventura and Vince McMahon because there was issues with royalties and stuff. Uh, Jesse the Body wanting to do his own video games, wanting to do the Predator movie, and Vince wanting to get the rights and own a percentage of Jesse the Body. I am so sorry. <laughs> I got burned yeah, well, there for a second. The Dr. Pepper got me. Right. That that came, you know, that came about where Ventura was trying to get a um uh oh, what's it called? The Royals. Teamster. No, he was trying to get a Teamster. Oh, he thing. wanted to get the union together for like yeah, WrestleMania yeah. too. Yeah, he wanted to put a union together. Apparently Hulk Hogan sold him out on that um and told Vince about it. Like that caused a lot of heat between Apparently, Ventura and Hogan still don't talk today, even though they used to be workout partners back in the day. Um, you know, Ventura, he dreamed big, but he also knew his value. And he knew what Vince was doing by buying guys' names wasn't going to benefit him in the long run. He didn't trust his promoter. And, you know, he shouldn't. And, you know, Dwayne Johnson did the same thing when he first went to Hollywood. Like, he used The Rock for a moment, and then he stopped using The Rock completely because every time he used The Rock, he had to pay Vince McMahon. And then finally they came to an agreement as well. So, you know, Jesse was, he saw the big picture way back then as Vince was going national. So you can't really blame Jesse, but yeah, like if you like listen to that commentary, like I don't think, I think he's back on now, 
But for a while, like they had dubbed commentary over Jesse's commentary. And it was just, it was, it was like watching the video game. Like it was so bad. Well, they did it that way because they actually have a clause in their contracts. That's the Ventura clause now. And what it talks about is that's why they have what I call the WWE identity crisis, where they have all of these guys that will be established indie stars, but then they rebrand them as WWE characters because the WWE wants to own the rights to everything they do. So if they go anywhere while they're under WWE contract, they have to be Sasha Banks instead of Mercedes, or they have to be, you know, uh, Naomi instead of Trinity Fatu. Like, they have to pick these WWE-style creative names versus going by their real names. And it was because of Jesse the Body that this became a thing. Because he would go out and be something. He would go be Jesse Ventura somewhere else. But Vince McMahon would still want to lay claim to him. And he's like, but I'm not being the body here. I'm just Jesse Ventura the person. Right. And because of that, that's where a lot of this stuff came from. Yeah, I think when Jesse got elected uh, governor, I think it was called Jesse the Mind Ventura. Well, Allison, you. What, Bowie? Are you still awake? Yes, I'm awake. Okay. Do you have one on your list? You got another scandal for us? Um, I do. Um, Don Marie suing WWE for fi- for firing her for being pregnant. Ooh, what's up with that? Talk about it. Um. Do you got your notes up? <laughs> uh, she filed a wrongful termination suit against the WWE that would make the promotion like think twice about like how they terminated women. Um, while out on leave, she was released by the company. Um, it was during one of Linda's <clears throat> campaign runs, and so it I guess it ended up hurting her campaign at the time. Well, I we, think what her pain was her running. Huh. We know WWE's done a lot of twisted, crooked things with pregnant people's storylines. They did the Maria Canales, Mike Bennett story, the is it his, isn't it his thing. They did the Mark Henry skit where she gave birth to a hand on live TV. Like, WWE has done plenty of effed up ideas with <laughs> pregnant women. It's key, kicking the baby. Oh, yeah. Like, they've done lots of fucked up pregnant women ang- angles. Um, so the idea of them firing somebody because of it, like, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, there yeah. was also that whole thing about them. Off TV. They, they fucked up last year or the year before with uh, Charlotte because one of the tests came back and said that Charlotte was pregnant when she wasn't, and they took her out of a match because they thought she was pregnant, and they were like, oh, shit, we fucked up. You're not actually pregnant. That's on us. Sorry. Yeah, that was the scariest two weeks of my life. I hate you so much, Bobby. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, they've had lots of questionable choices about women. Like, women fired on leave or not given guarantees about coming back on leave. Um, Not to mention the countless... um, allegations of assault by Vince and other members of the making them bark on TV huh making them bark on TV well no we're just, I'm talking about like not on air sexual assault situations no. like there was a thing with the ref there was a thing with the the chick at the tanning salon there's all this stuff that there you call her a chick well, I mean, if you want to go, you want to look at some of the Vince stuff. I mean, the earliest account, I think, was 1983, 1986. And throughout the company's history, like, they go from that point all the way to the most recent one. That was what started the whole catalyst of finding out, which ultimately cost the company, like, $19.2 million in money to figure out all of the scandal that he did. So if you look at the nineteen million plus the thirteen million that he spent in hush money or whatever it turns out, you're looking at like you're talking well over thirty million dollars just so that Vince McMahon could get outed for being a creepy old man whore. Bobby, we do it every Thursday night for you for free. I know. I was gonna I was trying to like think I was like 
try to be quiet so like it would just kind of go over <laughs> next <laughs> It cost WWE $30 million to say that, and we say it every Thursday night on air. You're just a creepy old man. We just try to keep you like in reins as much as we can with it. Very true, and Paige Van Zant is having a tough time with that. You do. You're so creepy stalker online. I love it, Bobby. Don't ever stop being you, please. That's not what the police report said. Uh. Um, one on my list is a big one and we've actually got an episode coming up the first week of December uh, after the Thanksgiving holiday break Bobby we're doing it with BC Hunter and Ted the Hillbilly Hill we're going to run back the Bruiser Brody and uh, the World Wrestling Council episode we did for Puerto Rico and I think it's hard to talk about scandals in the re- in territories and not bring up Bruiser Brody he was super huge in AWA and some of the rivalries he's had through there with Adula the Butcher. And then he went to Puerto Rico, had this, the, all the stuff tied in with him possibly buying the promotion. And then, you know, the untimely assault in the locker room that took his life. Tony Atlas is, was there and saw it live. All the, the sad and tragic things that go into the Bruiser Brody situation. Uh, what do you guys think about Brody? You know, watching Brody growing up, like he was like he was, you know, you talk about AWA. I think of Brody in WCCW and every time he got in the ring, it was a blood fest. Like it was an absolute blood fest, Uh, especially him and Abdullah. Um, The fact that he went to Puerto Rico, went to a shower to have a conversation with um, Jose Gonzalez, uh, the masked assassin, I believe, or masked assassin Two, the invader, the invader. Sorry. And never came back out um you know the guy was married he had a a young child um tony atlas and dutch mantel sat outside that shower and didn't go in to help him um you know they they did help him after the after the incident happened uh they helped you know the the paramedics weren't strong enough to lift him up um i'm not uh so our lawyers are listening. Um, this is the reason why I don't think Carlos Colon should be in the WWE Hall of Fame. If you don't put other guys in WWE Hall of Fame, like a Canadian Crippler, or you remove a guy like a Superfly, then I don't think that Carlos Colon belongs in the Hall of Fame because he's just as guilty as those two individuals. I can agree with that statement. I think that... Uh... Carlos Colon did. And then you look at somebody like Carlito, which was genuinely one of the most over stars in WWE at the time, you know, and uh, he was, you know, Carlos Colon's son, you know, directly tied into all of this. And he was also huge in WWE, super over, still wrestles to this day using his dad's name now that he's out on the indie circuit. But all of this is still in 2022. We've got wrestling tied all the way back to Puerto Rico and what happened that night with Bruiser Brody. Yeah, and like you know, this is already like a very tough territory. Like this is a territory known for throwing batteries at people. Like this is a territory that's rough from the fans. But you know, it's almost a mob mentality that Cologne had in the back of the house as well in the locker room. And Invader, you know, did he go in there on his own, or because he was a number two to Cologne? And I don't know many number twos that act on their own without number one telling them to act on their own. And if you question that, I would tell you to go to the 1970s and rent the movie The Godfather. Hmm. Make sure you make sure you uh, rewind. Be kind and rewind the VHS. Are you giving a turn. shout out to Aaron and Kai right now? The rewind. You see what you did there? You're oh. so clever, Bobby. <laughs> helping, helping free shout out for Kai. Look at Bobby giving Kai Tai a shout out. I know, always. Um, but yeah, so best again, friends forever. But number number twos do not act without their number one telling them to act. And again, our lawyers are listening. This is just me with my opinion, rated Y, that Carlos Colon was part of it and part of the conspiracy. And it wasn't his physical hand. But if you look in history and you look at mass murderers, Charles Manson never actually stabbed anybody either. But he went to jail for life. Bobby just compared Carlos Colon to to Charles Manson. I'm going to sound clip the fuck out of that one. 
All right, guys, <laughs> you each get one more each, and then we're taking it home for the night. I don't care who goes first. One of you say something, then the other one say something. You got one more scandal for me? Um, we didn't Go ahead, talk Alice. about the plane ride from hell. The plane ride from hell, that's a solid pick. Way to go. Also from before 2019, so way to go on that one, Miss Eagle. Way to knock it out. Uh, I think the plane ride from hell was one of those things that was spoken at nauseum when that episode of Dark Side yes. of the Ring came out. Everybody was talking about what happened, what was said, the Scott Hall stuff, the Ric Flair stuff. Um, let me ask you guys a question now. Do you think society... Ha we all say repeatedly that we all know Ric Flair is still a creepy old man. He was a creepy old man before the plane ride, before the show, everything. Uh, do you think the short-term memory of society and mass media has already forgotten that we don't like Ric Flair? I think hey. wrestling fans... Go ahead, Allison. No, you go ahead, Bobby. Your answer no, you is probably smarter than mine. No, I'm saying wrestling fans are going to love who they love. And they love Ric Flair, the character. Um, Richard Flair is somebody different. And I think we've talked about this before with Hogan and Terry Bollea. Um, You've got to separate the two. You know, Michael Jackson, I like his... But was he touching little boys? I don't know. So am I not supposed to like his music because of the allegations against him? Flair, this was a different time, um, a different era. Things were, you know, a lot... Like, if you go back and you watch the first Iron Man, when Tony Stark goes on his airplane, all his stewardesses become prostitutes and start dancing around and stripping. So it's a different time. And I think even then, like in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, when the plane ride happened, guys weren't on their cell phones. They were still playing jokes with each other, shaving guys' eyebrows, uh, you know, wrestling around, tying balloons to their private parts and keeping it up that way. Um, so was it acceptable locker room style behavior? At that point in time, yes. Um, I guess today, no. I mean, it shouldn't have been acceptable then. We just looked the other way. It's not of a point of it being a time thing. Like Things like that should have never been tolerated. However. But they were is the problem. Right. You know, and that's one of those, like, uh, what's it called? The statue of limitations on something. You know, people want to bring up the terrible things <laughs> that Corny said 25 years ago. But also, do we think about the things that, the terrible things that I'm sure Fritz Von Erich said behind closed doors in the Dallas Sportatorium? You know what I mean? Booking in the 60s. Can we think about the absolute terrible things that were said in wrestling in the 60s back then? It's not a but matter I, of... The, it doesn't take away from how terrible those things were that were said. It's like a matter of, like, are we going to try to go back in time and find every single remark that's ever been made that was questionable? No. Right, but I think you have to look at it, too, as it's the time, like in the time period. Like, if you look at our forefathers and what they did, you know, at the beginning of the country... You know, and, you know, what they partook in, you know, whether it be owning human beings or things like that, it was acceptable at that period of time. But does that make it right now? But I go further and you go in the 60s and 70s and you look at comedians, for example, you've got a Red Fox or you've got an Archie Bunker um, that, you know, you've got the Rat Pack and they're pointing out things, you know, having fun, whether it be, you know, religious or. Uh, based on um, culture. Was it funny then? Yes, they thought it was funny. And are some of those jokes still funny today? Yes, unless you're ultra sensitive. And I think it's one of those things, again, as we move forward and as we grow as a society and as humans, you know, maybe some of those things, maybe we look at too much and we focus too much on the negative of it or we look for a negative. Um but yeah, I think society, as society changes, you do have to change with society. And that's why somebody even like David Chappelle has a tough time going out on the road now because he does have that style of Richard Pryor um, and Red Fox and all those uh, comedians from that point in time. So, you know, it's it, there's got to be a balance. And uh, I'm not condoning Ric Flair's behavior at all. 
But at that point in time, again, this was a locker room, um, a boys club. And um, at that point in time, it was acceptable. At this point in time, it's not. Right. I mean, and it's more about like them recognizing it now and being like, yeah, what I did then was shitty and I'm sorry. Like, it's all about like the growth. Agreed. I mean, if I look at the stuff I did in my late teens, early 20s before social media was a thing, really, like, I would have to be apologizing for stuff that I said and did then because we were all young and dumb and stupid. And once again, this isn't about making excuses for being an asshole. This is about being, you know, a 16-year-old Baker Mayfield tweeting out rap lyrics and then being canceled for it 10 years later. You know what I mean? Like, this is kind of where I'm going with it. Not everything is malicious, but sometimes, you know, people are being held accountable like the things they said were. Right. In high school, again, thankfully, there weren't social media. There wasn't cell phones. Um, you guys still legitimately... used an abacus, right, Bobby? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, like, legitimately, my group in high school was called the Assholes because we played jokes on everybody. Like, our school was our locker room. So... A girl could get pants as easy as a guy could get pants in the in the lunch line. Like it was just what we did. It wasn't bullying because I would tell you what, if anybody ever messed with the people we messed with, then we were big brother and took care of them. And it's it's again, it's just a different society. Agreed. Bobby and Mack, during, you're gonna close my, it out. Reunion, yeah, during my twenty year reunion, all the kids that, you know, we whatever was right at my table talking to me and you know, wanting to be friends. All right, Bobby, you're going to round us out. Time to take us home. You got one more spot for us to fill. Uh, I guess, you know what? I'm going to go back to 1984 um, and look at Black Saturday. One of the most controversial times ever. WWE buys the spot um, on Atlanta TV, the Superstation, um, and displaces Jim Crockett Promotions. And, Famously, Vince McMahon was on TV with uh, oh, what's uh, Bob Connell? Bob Connell. And after a few weeks, uh, the the people of the South, the people of the Superstation, complained to TBS and said, "We don't want this here anymore." So what happens? Jim Crockett takes a million dollars, gives it to Vince McMahon to buy his spot back. Vince McMahon takes that million dollars and invents a little show called WrestleMania. And with all that Black Saturday stuff, he bought all the remaining territories inside of Georgia Championship Wrestling and the final parts of uh, Championship Wrestling of Florida and FCW. And he kind of went through there and kind of went roughshod on all of the remaining territories that weren't Jim Crockett promotions that JCP couldn't afford. McMahon came through the American South and scooped up everybody's roster that was left and took and picked it to bones and then threw the breast back out to the wild. Uh, that was yep. all around that same time, that 83, 84 range. That was super right. big because when Vince took those rosters, a lot of those guys had never wrestled north of the Mason-Dixon line. And then they yeah, all got what, sent north and they didn't know what to do with it. Yep, two of his biggest partners in it were the Briscoe brothers. Yep, because they were, had taken over uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling at that point. Yep, the only person to really go against Vince at that point in time was Ole Anderson. And only to this day, still does not acknowledge Vince McMahon or the WWE and refuse their Hall of Fame. Good old Ole Anderson. All righty, guys. That's it. We did it. We made it. Uh, this is the part where I stop talking. I tell you all to plug your stuff. Tell everybody where to find you and what you've got going on. Go ahead, Allison. Are you going to let me go first, sir? Ladies first. I could say something really terrible, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter, I guess, until it's dead. Apparently, everybody's tweeting. R.I.P. Twitter. I don't know. Um, and TikTok at JustAGirl918. Um, I don't post a lot of TikToks. I should. Because <laughs> I want to go live with these fools. But uh, I have a real job, so I can't. But yeah, 
follow me on the Twitters and the Tiki Takis. I post funny things and some thirst traps and stiff. Bobby. All right. <laughs> so you can follow me on Twitter, on Twitch, on TikTok, all at the Yellow Shoe Guy. Um, I will put up some really stupid content. I'll put up some wrestling content. And if you like some booty, I'll put up some female wrestlers wearing uh, wearing pajamas, wearing swimsuits as well. So <laughs> follow me on those three mediums. Uh, I look forward to interacting with you. Sometimes I say things that people don't like, and other times I don't care. Sometimes. Sometimes. You all should go follow Marie Shadows. You guys should all go follow M-A-T-T-R-I-D-D-E-R, Matt Ritter, over at Smackin' It Raw. Uh, he's also behind Creation World and a lot of that stuff, so getting off uh, the House of Dragons, um, you know, all the, the cool creative stuff they've got going. Follow Katie Kinsey Baby with the She Elite Showcase. Um, follow Ted the Hillbilly Hill at the Hill Truth Podcast. Follow Mr. 8984 RN and the Kai Tai Show over at the Rewind. We rewind. Um, follow the Indie Wrestling Gazette at the Indie Gazette. That's the the indie fo- indie centric focused newsletter that's powered by Botchbots and Share Shots. Check all of the blog stuff out at Botchbots and Share Shots.com. And now, as we close another episode of Botch Bots and Share Shots, I want to take a minute and thank you for listening and remind you to go wherever you do anything on the internet. Like, follow, subscribe, unsubscribe, then subscribe again. Leave a five-star review telling us how great we are or leave a one-star review telling us how terrible we sound. Either way, they help the algorithm and they help find new listeners. If you're feeling really generous and be one of the VIP people, head over to patreon.com and donate to the Smack Draw Podcast Network. You get some fantastic swag. We get some fantastic guests. It's a win-win for the Yellow Shoe Guy, Bobby Mack, for the Boss Bitch, Miss Allison Siegel. I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people.